Hafa Day and welcome to our next installment of Creative Conversations. Guahu si Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero. And I'm the managing editor of the University of Guam Press. Um, we are very honored today to have to feature one of our authors, Dolores Barcina Santos. And I'll tell you a little bit about her in a little in a few minutes. Um, but first, I'd like to share uh, who we are and uh, what this series is all about. So the University of Guam Press uh, here at the University of Guam advances regional scholarship, develops cultural literacy, and expands accessibility to knowledge about Micronesia by providing high quality peer reviewed publishing services. Um, UOG Press has a wonderful collection of local literature, children's books, and academic publications, which can all be found on our website, uog.edu backslash UOG Press, and at all local book vendors. With generous support from the Guam Economic Development Authority, we support a community of writers through a program called Manietlan y Mentitigi, a writer's fellowship that includes uh, a variety of different activities. Manietlan y Mentitigi translates into siblings who write, and truly that is at the heart of this program. Uh, we have 18 writers in three different uh, peer review workshop groups who meet every other week to provide feedback on each other's writing. Um, we host uh, several community events, including um, our upcoming writing retreat, uh, which will take place in Malasu at a seaside B and B Airbnb, uh, where we're going to allow writers uh, time and space to focus on their writing, um, and we have uh, public readings and conversations with authors um, as part of what we call our Creative Conversation series. Uh, the goal of Creative conversations is to connect authors and artists and to create space for us to inspire and learn from each other. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our Manyet Luni Mentitigi Fellowship Director, Akina Chargalov, who will introduce our presenter today. Hafa day, Akina. Hafa day, Lola. Thank you. And hafa day, everyone. So today we are honored to be joined by Dolores Barcina Santos, the author of this beautiful children's book I have here, uh, 13 Months of Melissa. This book tells a story about our Chamorro ancestors and how they mark time using the faces of the moon and the important seasons in their lives. Months were named to describe seasonal weather and the best times to fish, plant, and harvest food. And just like our ancestors, the Barcinas girls, Ha'ani, Rita, Leah, Lily, and Arissa, mark time using the seasons of the beautiful Sonsa Melissa. So first and foremost, Jesus Masi, Dolores, for being here. If you'd like to open up with a couple of words. Have a day, yes. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a great um, outlet that you guys have at UOG Press to be able to have these different creative conversations and to just talk about the writing process, creative process, kind of collaborate amongst other writers and kind of get inspired. So thank you so much for thinking of me and including me, and I'm excited for today. So thank you. Welcome. We're so happy to have you here. So we are joined by two of our fellows who are actively participating in our peer review writing workshop group. So we have Edward Faji Jr., <clears throat> an English major at UOG, and Megan Tyagui, an English teacher at Southern. Thanks for being here, guys. So I guess we could just open up the conversation. Does anyone else or does anyone want to start with their questions? Mm -hmm. Hi, Hoffa J. Thank you for being here. I just want to say that um, when your book first came out, I actually went to the the opening or the the very first day of it, where it was down in Malasu, and you had your your reading and your signing. So I was able to get a signed copy by you that day, and I and even by the artist. And I was just so glad that I was able to get that chance to actually hear you read it live. Um, so my question for you um, would be, what was your creative process um, and your publications process to get this book, um, you know, to where it is at today? Hafidi, Megan, thank you so much for your question and for coming all the way down to Malesu. <laughs> I know you mentioned you teach at Southern, but you know, Malesu is still pretty far from a lot of things. So thank you so much. That means a lot to me. Um, well, the 
publishing part and just the writing part, I honestly started off at the University of Guam um, as an assignment for one of my classes under um, Mrs. Keisha Borja Kichichu Calvo, all her names and her glory. Um, and it was just to create a book, write a lesson, pre cre um, present the lesson um, in front of the class. And it ended up tying in some cultural aspect, right? And so we came up with the idea of doing the Chamorro lunar calendar and trying, because, you know, we don't really talk about the lunar calendar. It's not really something that is, you know, known out here on Guam. I know that the fishermen use it all the time at the co-op and maybe even at the farmer's co-op. And uh, but it's not something that kids really know about. I didn't know about it too much growing up myself. Um, so we said, why not kind of implement it somewhere in the lesson? And I came up with this book that was just a bunch of my family pictures with things that we did in Mariso growing up at my Nana and Papa's house. We were out in the jungle, in the river, in the yard, just like having our own adventures. And I collaborated with my cousins to, you know, kind of brainstorm the things we do during the different months of the year and then turned it in, did the assignment. And then they said, turn it into UOG Press and, you know, maybe they'll pick it up. Right. And so time goes on. And a few months later, I get an email from Lola saying, we're interested in working with you on your book. And I was like, wait, hold on for real. Like, <laughs> I didn't think that that was going to happen. I was like, out of all the books from my class, you know. Um, and then working with Lola and um, the folks down at UOG Press was amazing. We got to go through um, a selection of artists, working with illustrators and to kind of bring the book to life. I was meeting with Lola like once every week for like two years. I think it was a span of over two years. So I saw so much of Lola and the staff and everybody down at UOG Press like all the time. And um, it was a lot of collaboration with them. And then they did the hard work of going out and collaborating with the community down at the fishermen's co-op, farmers co-op. So it was like this long journey of from a school project at UG to this beautifully like finished book that's on the shelf now here on Guam and even on Amazon. So it was two years of just writing and waiting and putting it together and making it perfect before it came out. So yeah, it was. It was a really a, it was a lot of hard work, but it was such a great process to be a part of and to go through. Okay, thank you, Megan. Um, I'm actually kind of curious, and maybe um, Lula could speak on this too, like how the creative process from editor and writer and how that kind of like manifests in its own beautiful relationship, right? To make such a beautiful publication. So, did you want to speak on? Yeah, sure. I was going to see. So, I mean, for, for me, one of the things about this book is that um, I really feel very passionately about our calendar. And so I was so excited when I saw this manuscript. But my role is that, you know, because I received the manuscripts, I don't accept them. We What we do is that when a writer submits a manuscript for publication consideration, we basically remove the author's name and any identifying uh, information about who the author is. And then I select a panel of reviewers um, and create a review board. And typically the review board is composed of people that are experts in that genre. Um, if it's for children's literature, I'll tend to choose like uh, parents of, you know, who have kids that are in that age group and teachers who uh, teach in that age group. And then as well as, you know, writing experts or other authors and so um you know it takes a while for the review to happen and so when it came back with what's with such high scores i was so excited because i really loved the concept i thought that it was really incredible um to not only feature the way our ancestors mark time but to show that even today and even if the if the ways we mark time have changed uh, at the heart of it you know the village and the family and our land is kind of what really shapes the way we mark key things in our life, right? So we mark time based on um, the seasons of our village. And so Malesu is such a beautiful village. And so um, to work on this was really exciting. And Dolores and I were very patient because uh, we actually had to um, 
had two other artists before we uh, had the artists that actually illustrated the book. So, um, you know, we we would get so excited because, you know, we'd have a new artist and their vision was so incredible. And then, you know, life happens or other commitments come in the way. And so we had unfortunately lost our first two artists and we were always like, wow, that was so amazing. How are we going to find someone else? And then the next artist came in like, oh my God, this is so incredible. And then finally, when we found Jessica Paris Jackson, um, I mean, her work just blew us away. It was almost one of those things where uh, it was meant to be, you know, and um, and so the more that the illustrations would come in, and this is what I love about children's books. Some people think because children's literature is shorter that it's so easy to write. Um, but in fact, actually, with all of the children's books, we go through at least like I would say tw up to 20 rounds of edits back and forth. And then once the illustrations come in, you have to revisit the text again. And then when it's laid out, you revisit the text again. And so even all the way till it's laid out on the page, um, because with kids, we wanna make sure that everything is clear, everything connects. And so uh, in that process, like Dolores said, we saw each other a lot, <laughs> we called each other a lot. And I think what was really, um, beautiful about it is that we both came from this deep love for our culture and this desire for others to know what we were learning in the process. So yeah, how was it for you, Dolores? Oh, yeah, exactly how you felt was how I felt. Just, I was, you know, I was going through those two artists who were so amazingly talented. I mean, every single artist that we worked with was just like, wow, this is amazing that we have this talent on Guam. Um, and like you said, we would get excited because we see something and I would envision the whole book. And then, like you said, life happens, you know, and then we go through the next one and then the next one came. And what I learned throughout all of that is that it was kind of meant to be because we were learning so much through collaborating with everybody while we were kind of waiting for the right artist to come through, you know? So we were able to collaborate among so many people to where we put everything together and the layout was perfect and the content, the writing of the story and the, the educational context of the story was there and it was solid and it matched every single part that Jessica illustrated. And so it was long, it was two, two years of waiting and okay, let's, let's edit this, let's change this, let's tweak it. But at the end, it was like this really beautiful thing that came together and it was worth the wait <laughs> and worth all the visits to UOG Press every week. <laughs> it was so much fun. One of the things that uh, stood out for me in Megan's question, and then we'll pass it over to Eddie, um, is that um, is the fact that Megan went to the launch, you just reminded me of like how incredible it really was because this was one of my most favorite book launches. It was, you know, at the um, right at the pier in that old, it used to be an old schoolhouse and now it's a community building. And um, it had that feeling of like this, like of history in it. And then we had a DJ and a full spread of food and the whole village turned out. And so it was so beautiful. Like I felt like I was at a party. And so I'm like, so serious, the books we've published that have any connection to Malasu, like draw the biggest crowds, you know, because even we published um, Difunce and Fred Kinani's collection of poetry and his launch was here at the press. And I swear the line for autographs, like there was a line from 6 to 9 p.m. That's how many people showed up. We sold out his book in like one night and almost everybody was from Malasu. And then the same thing happened with 13 months in Malasu, that pride and that you know, that dedication to the village and also just your family and the connections that everybody had. I mean, you know, everybody was so, um, the whole vibe of the launch was people sharing their own stories and their own memories. And, um, you know, Dolores's cousins who are featured in the, in the book did this gorgeous, you know, green backdrop. Like, you know, it was like incredibly better than anything you'd find on Pinterest. <laughs> and, and there was like a nice little stairwell that they, they turned into a play area for the kids. So, I mean, I think that it really, I think brought to life the book. It was almost like you got to 
see it in, in real life. And it was such an honor to even experience the book launch. And I think it kind of really goes to the heart of our philosophy here at the press that these books are, are more than just what's on the page. They're, they're part of our community and they re represent our community. And so, um, yeah, I wanted to share that memory because it was really cool. <laughs> So, Eddie, do you have a question? Yes. Half a day, Dolores, Sizo Smasi, Pari, Tianfomu. I think it's, I'm, I'm happy to be here because uh, I guess I represent um, just an outlier. I have not um, attended the launch, but I've just heard so much about 13 Months of Malesu, and I've been a big fan of it. Um, apart apart um apart from it and it's been on my book list forever and it's just finally having uh, to do the research and about your book is just so inspiring to me it's just this is a um, a collected work that is so beautifully crafted and you could tell the hard work and deter, um, dedication to it and the beauty and artwork and imagery of just the words alone um along with the the, the beautiful art is just so inspiring for myself to write something as well. And, and I just wanted to take the time to say um, thank you uh, for putting it out there or, and then also the UOG Press for um, continuing that process. It really did just like, I feel if like, if I'm inspired, I'm sure that there's someone more, there's more people in our community that's just as inspired. So that will be a, a segue into my question. So sorry for uh, that. Um, like, what do you, um, what advice do you have for writers who want to um, immerse themselves in our land, immerse ourselves in the culture and the community and actively try and look for inspirations for a piece? Like, what do you recommend we do? Well, half a day, Eddie, thank you so much for all those kind words. You're so sweet, thank you. Um, for your question, my advice for that is to really key in on, you know, Armanamku. You know, this story derived from my Nana and Papa, you know, and it derived from their home and their yard and their backyard and the back kitchen and being able to put your own experiences into writing, into a book, whether it be for um, an audience of children, teens, adults, young adults. Um, just really keying into your experiences. What are some things that you can learn from um, our elders? What are things that you've learned throughout the years of growing up on Guam? If you're talking about culture, what are some things that really stand out to you about our Chamorro culture? Um, and what is so different about our culture compared to another culture? Um, and I think that's what really sets apart um, books from UOG Press and writings of people here from Guam, even children's books that I see all over the place, even before I wrote mine, was nobody else can relate to that except for us who grew up here. And I think that's what makes that so special. Um, so my piece of advice is to really write about what you experience, write about things that you learn from your nana, your papa, your mom, your dad, auntie, uncle, whoever has raised you, because you know, those people, we don't live forever. And I think those, when we write down those memories and we really pay attention to those experiences and we're not on our phone and we're not zoning out and we're not paying attention to other things and we really hone in on those experiences and that valuable time, that's what really makes our writing and our culture so strong and so very different from any other region of the world. It's, it all comes back to our manumpu and what we've learned and how we've grown up. And I think that's the biggest advice is to go off of that, definitely. Awesome. So I was thinking maybe we could talk a little bit about the content. Um, you know, one of the central features of the story, of course, is the Chamorro lunar calendar. And so I know for me, I didn't learn the calendar until I was an adult. Adult. And so I was really curious, uh, when did you first learn about our 13 months and um, how did you learn about it? And, you know, what, um, you know, what inspired you to make that the central feature of your book? Yeah, definitely. So my cousin Leah, who is in the book, um, she's like my sister, introduced me to the Chamorro Lunar Calendar, I think when I was in middle school. And 
the co-op was coming out with those um, published versions of the calendar. And she's like, Laura, look at this. It has all the moon phases and it tells you what fish is here and the weather, all of these things. And she's so into that, so into the seasons and the land and the moon. And so she was the one who really introduced that to me. And, you know, as time went on, she's like, look at the moon. How do you feel? You know, look what's in season. So she was the one who kind of really helped me key in on, okay, there is something definitely with this moon and the seasons and the fish and the land, right? And so growing up with that, just from middle school, um, it kind of helped give me more perspective as to why, like, we have a mango season, why we have crab festival, why we have, you know, all these things, banana season, rainy season, dry season. Um, and so learning that calendar was, was really important to me. It wasn't taught to me as a child, like my parents didn't really teach it to me, my non and papa didn't really teach it to me. Um, so it was more so like us cousins kind of discovering it on our own and making our own observations. And, um, you know, having those conversations with like my Nino, who's a fisherman, and what do you notice about the fish that are in in this season and whatnot? Thank you for sharing. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to just like dive right in. So, what's um, your favorite season? My, fa my favorite <laughs> season. Um, that's a good question because I feel like I have so many different memories in each season that it's it's hard to to really put I guess a good one uh, but my favorite would definitely be in the months of January February so that's my greenie right um, I also enjoy anything around Christmas so that's like that 13th month and so Mazangan Umagahoff all of those and I think it just goes into what I experienced around those times of just having a fresh start. I know that the, that's what the book opens with is welcoming the new year with family. And I think that's what's really important to me is it comes down to family and that's what that um, time of year, that's what that season represents to me is just being together. Even people who are off island come home, you know, we're all together, family. So those seasons of I guess you could say like November, December, January. So all of those phases are just my favorite because we're all together. So um, this project was for um, Nana, correct? Yes. Yes. What was her reaction when she was able to kind of like so take a look at it? Yeah. So initially when I did it for my UOG class, um, it was kind of for her because she does have dementia and so her memory is kind of in and out and we noticed that she loves to look at pictures whether it's just in a book a random book or even like family photos and so what we did was going through that original writing the story for my UOG class my cousins and I put together all these pictures from us growing up with her around my papa around who had passed away and um, so it was originally to help her like to kind of remember that during this season, we're picking mango with you like for two months, right? Just eating mango constantly. And this month we put up the balen and you weave the roof, you know, with Leah, Rita and Arissa. And for her to see those images were, was really important to me. And that's also why I wrote it was for, to help her kind of remember key things we did throughout the year. Um, what was her reaction? She still has the very first original book of what I turned it to, to my professor at UOG. Um, and she flips through it from time to time, asking, hey, that's me in the book. I'm weaving the blend, or hey, that's us and looking for the Easter eggs, or that's you, or whatever. And so though her memory may not be there and um, her mental health may not be there completely, she still has an understanding of what those pictures were um, who we are in those pictures, what we were doing. And um, that's great for me. You know, that's more than enough for me to, for her to, to know who we are in those pictures, even if we're, we're little and to know and to identify um, things that we were doing. So, yeah. 
Thank you for sharing. That was so beautiful. I think uh, Eddie has a question for you. I just uh, wanted to say that I thought that I agree uh, with that. I thought that was very beautiful and that um, your, your, um, your grandma was utilizing it as meant to be a children's book and it somehow also became this um, memory book or photo, photo book of like your life shared with her. And it's, I think that's beautiful. And it kind of goes along with what I have, what I was gonna ask, which is um, what, um, what would you like to see in the future of our like uh, Chamorro literature for the children, for the for the Manamku, for for um, for everyone. Like, um, would you like to see like advances in fiction? Would you like to see um, what is it that we can improve also in like our writing community to enhance that for for different audiences, for those who um, who are disabled, who um, who do have mm -hmm. dementia, and other mental health factors. Like, where where what is the limit? And I feel like you already know the answer, so I'm just gonna let you uh, bounce off that. I don't know the answer. <laughs> I'm thinking about that question I was asking, like, hmm, okay. Um, but no, that's, it's such a, and the reason why I don't know it is because there's just so many things that you can do, right? Um, I like how you mentioned, um, what, what can you introduce, right? What can we, what can we change? What can we add to the bookshelf of, the Chamorro writing or of us authors being Chamorro and putting books on the shelf that's different, right? And I think bringing up different issues of what we don't know, right? So things that were limited knowledge of, we didn't know really much about the calendar, right? Um, and then also bringing up something about health. Um, I know that that's such a big thing in our Chamorro culture is being healthy. Um, diseases, this dementia thing isn't just with my Nana, it's a bunch of Manamku who have it here on Guam. And so introducing those concepts, um, whether it even be to the younger generation, um, preteens, young adults, and writing about it in a way where, you know, it's kind of, it's an uncomfortable topic, but it's something that happens here. And um, it doesn't have to be this fancy children's story, but just something that there was more research done to it. There's, this is the issue, what can we do for the issue? Or maybe there's um, something that, um, that we just don't know more and we want to know more of. So I think what I would want to see is just more of those things that are unexpected. So we expect children's books, right? We expect kids' books to come out. We expect things to be about Nana Papa or um, about family or about adventures. But what other things that are outside the box about our culture that's different from everybody else can we put onto our shelves? And I think that would be really cool to see. That's awesome. So I do want to just invite those who are tuning in online, if you have questions, to go ahead and add them in the in the comments for this event. Um, and we'll be sure to start asking them in the second half. But I wanted to talk with Dolores a little bit about uh, becoming an author. And so I wondered, uh, you know, was this something that you had always dreamed of for yourself? Like, would, had you kind of had plans to do writing before this class? Or was it something that really just happened in the class and um, how do you feel about it now that you are a published author? Yeah, so growing up, um, I think writing composition was probably one of my favorite contents in school. I love to write. I, um, short stories, short essays, it was kind of always something that I was always interested in. Um, however, I always wanted to be a teacher. So being an author was never ever in my line of thought ever. Um, and so being challenged to create a book for that class just so happened to be a blessing in disguise and turned me into an, an actual, you know, locally published author. And um, that's amazing. And for that to happen here on Guam is just incredible. Um, but I have never thought I would be an author. My little kindergartner self saying I wanted to be a teacher just to write on the board never would have thought I would be, how old was I? 22, 23 with a book on the shelf, you know? So, I think it's it's really cool and I'm glad that I'm not glad I'm so grateful that it ended up happening this way and I love writing it's always been kind of a thing for me love to read and so now becoming an author is just awesome. <laughs> 
Yeah, what's interesting about that and I think inspirational for others is that um, maybe even if we don't set out to write a book, right, it's like life brings you to new things and and there's never, you're never too old or too young uh, to tell your story. And um, I think that what's really powerful about this book also is that um, sometimes we feel like the lives of our ancestors are so far away and that we're so different. And, you know, oftentimes when we think about our culture, people often, you know, make comments. And this was a lot, like, I would say a few decades ago, people were, would make comments like, oh, the Chamorro culture is dead, or there's no more Chamorros, or our language is dying. And I think, I mean, that then infuriated me. And even now, I think efforts like this really show that that is not the case. And that, um, there are things about us that even if we if we convey them in new ways are really rooted in our culture and our values and i think this book like taking um you know for example the way that we depicted the building of the belen and compared it with the thatching of the roofs you know at yeah. the exact same time of year right and it's interesting because the the months that you pointed out as being your favorite are the ones that um particularly are when people are kind of quieting down and spending time in the village and spending time with family right um mm -hmm. the rest of the calendar too is really dedicated to the hard work we put into fishing and farming and connecting to our land and we're still very much like that today and i think the book makes it accessible to us. It shows that you don't have to necessarily do what your earliest ancestors did to be considered Chamorro, right? We are Chamorro no matter what, even if we grow into new ways of, of practicing these values and living these values, um, they're part of us. So the way the book is featured is when you open it, you know, on the left side, we see what our ancestors did. And on the right side, we see what the Barcinas cousins do in Malesu. And even though it may look different, it also blends perfectly well. And I thought that that was really cool because I think in many ways, um, you're showing people what's possible not just you can be a published author uh, and but also you can learn about your culture and your history, no matter how old you are. Um, and so I, I want to thank you for that because I think that's a really important thing for people to know. Yeah, I want to thank you for that because that whole concept of putting, uh, you know, the olden days like they like to say the old Chamorro days on the one side and then what we experienced on the other side and having it kind of mirror each other and writing about it. I learned so much through that and it wasn't new information. It was just things that I didn't realize were exactly the same that happened way back when and happened now. Um, and so putting those two elements together, it was just such an eye opener for me. And then, like I mentioned, I didn't learn about the Chamorro Lunar Calendar, you know, from the womb and automatically, you know, I knew what Inero Fibero was type to my green, in my, no, like I had to, you know, we had, we learned it as we grew up and you're never too young and you're never too old to learn these things. And like you said, to, to experience new things about your culture and about your family and it just takes you down so many different alleys and you can end up being an author <laughs> that you end up being an author of a children's book like it's just amazing so thank you so much for that too Lola. Viva so the very first question you received uh, is from Rosanna Castro she says your book is reaching children with Chamorro heritage living abroad who have not experienced the island in person. Your story uses literature to make an abstract concept like cu culture relatable for young and developing minds. Thank you for sharing your talents and bringing our culture to life by telling your story. Do you have any ideas in mind or plans for a next book? Oh, thank you. Well, Rosanna is actually my cousin in Washington. So thank you. Um, I always get questions of when are you going to write a next book? Is it going to have boys? Because this one is all about girls. Um, and so if I were to write anything um, next, then yes, there would definitely be about boys, something with boys. And even my brother was like, you know, I'm not even anywhere in this book and I'm your brother. <laughs> um, but um, man, as for a next, 
a next book, I get that question so often, um, even now, two years after the book came out. Do I have any idea of what to write? No. <laughs> but do I want to write something? I do. I, I think I'm kind of just still playing with the idea of kind of like I was talking to Eddie about was there's no limit as to what you can write about. So it's just picking and choosing about something that's important to you culturally, um, something that may be important to you on Guam, and maybe for people who live off island, those children who have grown up, you know, off island but are Chamorro, what are some things that, you know, are important to them and kind of bringing that to life through a book and kind of reaching out to different audiences. So there really is no limit, but I definitely will include something with with boys in my next in my next book if I were to write one. Uh, your cousin Leah says no boys, girl power. You yeah. <laughs> can allow an only. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, um, that was a joke. I mean, in Marisa, we were all we were known as that. The Barcinas girls are here. Oh, are you gonna go to the the girls' house? The Barcinas girls, you know. So we have a family full of girls. So naturally, it just came out as, oh, the Barcinas girls, everybody knows us as that. So it's just funny. But even my brother was like, that's so rude. You didn't even include me and I live with you. Like, <laughs> like okay, mine, my next one will be just about you <laughs> and your experiences <laughs> with growing up with five Chamorro strong girl power around you. <laughs> I would love to read that book, actually. <laughs> so um, we have a um, bunch of questions coming in. So this is great. Um, so one is from Derby Santos. Why did you choose to hold your book launch at the schoolhouse in Melissa? First of all, hi, mom. Um, I chose to hold that at the, well, when this book came out and Lola said, no, we're going to publish it and it's for reals and we're going to have it on this day. Um, I think that was really surreal. And that whole time of writing the book, I kept passing by that schoolhouse and I was like, mom, that building, I wanna have my launch there because it needs to be in Marisa. You know, we need to bring these people who are gonna read this book down to Malesu. Like they have to experience what I call the um, Malesu magic, right? And we can't, we don't, maybe we'll bring them to the house, but let's bring them to this historical place of education. Um, I've had my papa's siblings attend school there as children. There was, we actually found pictures of my auntie, of my great auntie who went to school when she was a little girl in that schoolhouse. We found it when we were cleaning it up. And then my nana taught in that school. And so just to have so many different generations go in and out of that school building, just being educated, like right on the ocean side. And those generations, me being related to them and this book kind of as a tribute to my nana and my family and it also being an educational tool like i'm like mom there's like no better place to have it than this um the schoolhouse and it was so beautiful walking into it i mean the floors were like the efit floors you know and the windows were just those old school louver windows and it was just amazing it was a really magical experience to just to be in that building and to know what it was and to know that it was a school and me being a teacher i'm like wow i can't even imagine i don't even know what it would be like to teach in that in that school and so that was that was really why it was to kind of bring it full circle and bring it back down to mariso and some type of education as well yeah, and I'm so glad you did. Like I said, it was totally my favorite book launch. So um, our next question is from Jesse Chatgala, Papade Chatlu. Um, could you speak on the process of getting a book published with UOG Press as far as getting help with editing and maybe some costs associated with publishing? Um, you can talk a little bit about what it was like for you and then I can also chime in. Okay, perfect. Um, so I know, like Lola mentioned um, before, it was all manuscript. So I had this as a book layout done just on Microsoft Word. And she said, when you submit it, strip it. Take out your name, take out, you know, all of those things, the pictures, just take it out. We just want the text, you know, and I guess um, when it goes through that panel, they want to really key in into what you're actually trying to write about and the ideas that you're bringing to the table. What are, what are you... 
what are you trying to teach? What are you trying to, you know, convey? Um, and so you submit a manuscript and like she mentioned, there's a whole panel that rate it, you know, is it readable? Is it age appropriate for the audience that it's targeting? Is it culturally relevant globally, just here on Guam? Um, and those are the different things that they rate you on. And from there, you cross your fingers and hope that Lola emails you <laughs> two months later and says, yeah, we're very interested in actually working with you. And from there, you meet Lola once a week for two years. <laughs> you, and you go through like a bajillion edits of um, how about we word it like this or how about we change this into this and um, kind of just tweaking it to make it more appealing to the audience and to make it more informational, educational. Um, and so, and then you pick out an artist, you get to go through this whole portfolio of artists that UOG Press has in store of just amazingly, incredibly talented local artists um, who have submitted their portfolio to the UOG Press. And from there, you just start collaborating and it's a great collaboration amongst the staff, amongst UOG Press and as well as the illustrator and those that you work with out in the community. And then eventually it goes out to get laid out as a book and then you have it in your hands. <laughs> so that's the whole process from an author standpoint. Awesome. Um, yeah, so, you know, I just speaking to the second part of the question about costs associated with uh, publishing. So UOG Press, uh, sometimes people think that we're just a printer. So sometimes people will say, oh, how much do you charge to print my book? And, I, and I'm like, oh, no, that's not what we do. And I'll refer them to local printers um, because we are a publishing house in every sense of the word. So, um, you know, if a book is accepted for publication, then um, um, we handle all of the costs. So um, once a manuscript is accepted, then as, as was mentioned, we provide thorough editing, we provide uh, if it requires illustration. And usually when it requires illustration, that's when it takes a little bit longer because especially if you're working with an illustrator from scratch and it takes time, it's a creative process. Um, and then after that, we, we, we hire very professional graphic designers. So one of the things that we pride ourselves on here at the press is that we hire local, we really try try to uh, ensure that all of the features of the book as much as possible are done by our incredibly talented local writers, authors, editors, etc. And so we have some incredible graphic designers who um, I think their layout skills are just so superb. Our books really stand out. Um, and then once it's laid out and it's finalized, um, we have wonderful printers that we work with. Um, I'm actually here in our book room. So behind me, you can see a lot of our titles. So we, we store the books, we market the books, um, and we distribute them worldwide. So our books are available in all local bookstores and on Amazon. Um, and now we are actually expanding um, our distribution offerings uh, through partnerships with other distributors in the United States to get it into other big national booksellers. So we continue to grow because we want um, all of our stories to, to be told um, for so long. You know, even in our own schools, our children are not reading stories about themselves. And so um, that's really at the heart of this effort is to ensure that we continue to keep our stories uh, out in our community and available through these books. Um, you know, if a book does not make it in the first round, um, we have incredible reviewers that will uh, provide comments. So, you know, say a manuscript doesn't score high. So we, you know, the, the categories that Dolores described are part of our uh, blind review scoring sheet. So each manuscript is scored. And if the score isn't high enough, um, typically what the reviewers recommend is revise and resubmit. And they leave very thorough comments. And then the author is always invited to revise their manuscript and resubmit it again for consideration um, until they get it right. You know, it's it's a process. And so that's actually why we created Manyetloni Mentitiki is because we recognize that our island is not short of talent. We're not short of stories, but we need to develop writing communities to support authors through this process because nothing is ever done in the first draft, right? It, it takes many, many drafts 
class. And so um, that's the goal of this program is that I think if we can continue to read each other's work and give each other feedback, we're all helping each other to better tell our story and bring it to life. So that's a little bit about our publishing process, but you're always free uh, to email us at uogpress at triton.uog.edu and we can send you our submission guidelines. Our submission guidelines are also available on our website. Uh, so please check it out. Um, okay, um, Megan or Eddie, do you want to jump in? Do you have any questions you'd like to add to? I have one more question and I just want to know like, how do you pick, like, or how did you pick your pictures of your family for your book? It must have been a very hard process to like pick which exact picture you wanted. Oh, yes. Um, and thank you for bringing that up. So Jessica did such a beautiful job of um, bringing those pictures to life. So I'm not too sure if everybody is aware that um, the pictures in the book are actually based off of family photos. Um, and Jessica just brought them into life, like just so amazing. Um, my family takes a bunch of pictures. And so our archive of photos from growing up was just so large. And I tried to pick photos that really represented like our personalities and, you know, who's, who's doing what, you know, um, who's really comes in the coconut back there, who's really weaving the hat, you know, and who's really thatching the roof with Nana for the Belen and who's really singing with Papa on the guitar. And so I really, we really tried to pick pictures that really symbolize us, you know, growing up. And um, going to that archive, those archives of pictures was just really fun for the whole family. I got even my aunties and uncles to give me pictures of us kids. Um, so picking family photos was really difficult because I love them all, but it was really important for me to pick ones that really truly represented, you know, who we are as the five girls being down there because we're all very different. And we all, you know, like different things. And so to be featured in different parts of the book, um, I really had to be mindful of what pictures I chose and who was doing that to make sure it was, you know, accurate and as authentic as it could be. So we do have a question that we received from Leah. <laughs> who is your favorite character in the book? <laughs> who is my favorite character? From the book my nana and papa <laughs> they were also mentioned in the book <laughs> no i love okay so we're a group of cousins you know we're, we're all so so close we're like sisters you know we grew up together we're always with each other so i don't have a favorite over the other i know leah will be like is over there on her computer screen like yeah right okay but <laughs> But no, we all grew up together. That's why this book is so special um, because we're like sisters and um, growing up together down there with our Nana and Papa, just kind of free range of everything, whatever we wanted to do out there was, was amazing. So they are my favorite character. <laughs> I also want to add during the launch, you guys also had like similar prints, right? Like you, you were matching and it was like really beautiful. Yeah. Was it Leah did the prints? Yeah, so she, like, yeah, so yes, so we did our best to emulate the moon phases um, on our dress. We're like obsessed with the moon, me and Leah. We're like moon, moon girls or something. I'm like, we're just so obsessed ever since she introduced me to that lunar calendar. Um, and so we're like, you know, we need to be distinct that we were the five girls in the book, right? Because I'm like, this event is not just about me, you know, it's about them, it's about my family. Let's make sure, you know, people know who they were in the book. And so Leo was like, we should print the moon phases on our clothes and our dresses. So that was a really, really cool thing to have and to be able to wear together. I wanted to share my own little personal memory of meeting all five of our Barcinas cousins. <laughs> so um, we, first of all, I wanna shout out and thank um, Leslie Travis, who's actually a member of our Manyet Luni Mentitigi um, Fellowship. She's in my writing group, um, but she's an incredible photographer. And so uh, we had this idea that uh, we wanted to actually show how glorious the sky is in Malasu. So uh, we drove, we, Leslie told us 
us what time at night would be perfect for capturing all the stars and we met at the pier and then um all, all five cousins came and then they were like no this isn't the right spot so we went to billy bay <laughs> and so it's like really dark we went to the bay and um this is what we were able to come up with and so this is an this is actually the night sky in Malasu and all the girls uh, holding hands under the sky. And it was such a fun experience because they had to stand still because she was doing like a time lapse. And you could tell everybody was trying not to giggle and just it was so much fun. Um, and just just the willingness to do everything we needed to do to make it a perfect book, even to meeting in the middle of the night in a dark beach <laughs> and like uh, taking pictures. So, um, yeah, thank you, Leslie, for that. And of course, meeting your cousins was really fun. Yeah, thank you. So, Leslie, it's such, that was such an amazing experience. And her photos turned out so beautiful. And if anybody knows the five of us girls, it is impossible to coordinate anything. So for us to have <laughs> even made it down there all together in the middle of the night was a miracle in itself. And then, you know, also that just goes to show that we're down to get in the dirty sand in the middle of the night. No fear, we're just in it. And that's how we were always outside and just in the dirt and the chickens in the back and in the river. So we're a good time. <laughs> so uh, we do have a question um, from Julie Cruz. What inspired you to write a book? Um, well, well, like I mentioned, it was for a class. Um, but you know, growing up, like I said, I've always loved reading children's books. I naturally just love, you know, children's books. And I liked to write. And I think, I don't think really from my family, anybody really expected me to write about the cultural side and the, the way we grew up in Mariso. But deep down, I'm always like just so paying attention to what is happening, you know, just really observant of the things that my Nana and Papa do. And really, I reflect a lot on, wow, they really just let a bunch of girls in the age of five to 10 just free roam in the back of, you know, backyard, like no rules, just go back and make sure you come back so we can go back home. And so what inspired me was, like I said, my Nana, to just kind of get those pictures together and talk about it to help her to remember. And then also, I was just so mahaling for my papa. Like, these were just things that we did all the time growing up. And um, I think this just became such a beautiful tribute to the two of them. Um, and what they they gave to us, you know, they they gave us those experiences. They gave, um, they gave us their home and their land and their culture. And we would not be here. We would not have those experiences or this book if it weren't for them. And... That's what inspired me is definitely them. So yeah, definitely miss my papa and I thank my Nana all the time. <laughs> Beautiful. So before we wrap up, Megan and Eddie, would you happy to have any other questions you'd like to ask before we close off? I would just like to comment and say that I did learn about the lunar calendar from your book, uh, even at my age. And I'm really glad that I was able to do more research after that because it has, um, you know, brought in my, my cultural experience. Thank you. I'm so glad. Yeah. So like I mentioned with even with Lola, this was such a learning experience. Um, I, it wasn't something that we grew up learning. And when I learned about it and writing this book, it was like an eye opener of, wow, okay, that's why we have those things at this time of year. And I think it's really special. It's something that I think everybody in Guam can relate to, even if you're not Chamorro. I mean, just really looking at and keying in at the seasons and what's in and what's not um, during the times of year is really important and really, really special. So thank you so much. I'd also like to comment that, uh... Oh goodness, I hope uh, you guys can't hear the side, but um, <laughs> I'm just gonna make it quick. Um, I just wanted to say some things that you said earlier kind of tie in in your book already, how you're mentioning how we should have books that talk about health. Um, I was just thinking about how, um, as we were talking, you mentioned the different uh, seasons pertaining to like um, gardening, I mean, agriculture and fishing and everything. And it, it does, it does that already. It promotes, um, uh, it promotes the um, Antigo diet. It promotes, um, or it promotes a a 
a diet that goes into our, our land and just seeks, uh, seeks, ev forgive me. <laughs> um, just, uh, it goes, it promotes that, it promotes that. Yeah, it kind of, it also <laughs> kind of explains as to why we eat what we eat, you know, because that's what we have. And that's what our ancestors had. We, you know, we eat all these things because that's what grew and that's what was in season and it kind of all just ties it up. So yes, thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. I think we have one more question here from Leah. Uh, what hopes do you have for young girls reading your book in the future? Yeah, be the fun of that one, right, Leah? Um, what do I have for girls? You know, I'm all about going outside and just, you know, getting down in the dirt, you know, and don't be afraid to get the manha opener from Leah and go pick a coconut and open it up and drink some money, you know? And, you know, the way kids are brought up, and I see it all the time because I'm an elementary teacher in public school. We're so consumed with social media, right? We're so consumed with, what are the Kardashians wearing? What does so-and-so have? What are these brand name things that, you know, are being represented in social media? But when it comes down to where we're from and, you know, who we are as the Chamorro people and our culture, that's not what we're about. You know, we're about um, sustenance and culture and being together with family, not about who or what we are, what we have. And so, you know, my advice for young girls is to never be afraid to go and make your own adventures with your girl pals, you know, your gal pals, girl power all the way, you know, your cousins, your sisters, your friends. And if they don't want to force them and encourage them to go, because Leah knows I was not the first one to hop outside there with her and like want to go to the river, but she dragged me out there. And, you know, we just discover all these things. And so my advice for young girls, um, is to just get those experiences, you know, don't be afraid to get dirty and to go outside, put your phone down for a second and enjoy what we have here on Guam, enjoy your Nana and Papa while you have them and really pay attention to these experiences that you have while you grow up because you're, you're only young for so long. <laughs> then you get old and have to get a job and so just enjoy it because being a young girl is just so much, there's never a more fun phase in your life. And so just be as adventurous and fearless as possible. Ah, uh, Viva, that's wonderful <laughs> advice. Thank you. Um, so as we close out, I just wanted to address one final question really quick. So uh, Julie Cruz asked if the book is in the libraries and has it reached the schools, both private and public? So a lot of our public school librarians have ordered the book and it is in their libraries. Um, there are copies at the Hagatnya Public Library and here at RFK. Um, and some teachers, I think, do use it in the classrooms. In response to the pandemic, uh, we actually worked with Dolores to make an audiobook version available on our YouTube page. So if you visit our YouTube page um, and look for University of Guam Press, you'll be able to find an audio version there. But uh, for teachers out there, if you're interested in using the book and want to order classroom sets through your administrators, um, please contact us. We'd be willing to work with you to do that because it really is a one wonderful resource, especially, you know, one of the things that we learn all the time is the four seasons, but those four seasons don't take place here. They take place in the United States. And so here we have a rainy and a dry season and we have our 13 months and we have, you know, the seasons of our, you know, fishing and farming. And I think that we should teach our children that first, you know, that's why when they're being asked in tests about fall and winter, um, it, it's not their context. And so I think that this book really um, gives teachers a resource to reframe learning so that the child is learning about our place first and then learning that weather is different in other parts of the world. So I think uh, I want to thank you for that, for censoring our experience in this book. And I can't wait to publish the next adventure of the Barcenas girls and boys so your brother doesn't <laughs> feel left out. Um, and I thank all of you for tuning in. Um, our next creative conversation uh, next month will feature um, a brilliant Chamorro woman working at Penguin Random 
Stonehouse for an imprint called Plume. We're very excited to talk with her, um, Jamie McDonald Knapp. So she's a daughter of Guahan doing some really big things in the publishing world. And so please stay tuned for more information about that. Um, we're also preparing to launch uh, Human Rights Attorney Julian Uggins book, The Properties of Perpetual Light on March 29th. And then we will also have a creative conversation with him. So lots of exciting things in store. So stay tuned, follow us uh, on social media, and we hope to see you again next month. Adios.